Okay, great. Um, so hello, I'm Adas, and I'm very excited to be talking to you here today. My talk today is centered around how we at AppsFlyer migrated a mission-critical service to Go. This service is very special to me and to all of us at our company since it was the first service we wrote in Go. And you'll have to wait until the end of the talk to find out how many services we now have written in Go and if this experiment was actually successful or not. Um, you'll walk out of here today with the tools to migrate a mission-critical service and maybe courage to introduce a new language at your company. So a little bit about me. I am Adas Yakubovic. Um, don't worry about my last name. It's a hard one, <laughs> even for me. Um, I'm a software team lead at AppsFlyer. I work there for two years and nine months. Um, I'm a proud gopher. I love Go. I love closure. And distributed real-time systems are really the sort of thing that gets me excited. And how can we do without? A little bit about AppsFlyer, where I'm coming from. <coughs> AppsFlyer is the world's leading mobile attribution and marketing analytics platform, <coughs> helping app marketers make better marketing decisions all day. So what is mobile attribution exactly? Very, very simply, it's the match uh, between a click a user makes on a campaign on their mobile application and then between an app install. Um, overall, we get an event center system whenever a user clicks on a campaign or whenever uh, that user makes a significant event in their mobile application. That way, we can know which campaign is worthwhile, uh, which is not worth at all, and which, um, I want to say, marketing platform is better. We have a lot of other features on top of it, but that's enough marketing material for now. And let's, let's dive in. We have uh, over 230 engineers. We have over 200 microservices, thousands of servers up on AWS, 90 billion, and yes, that's 90 billion events coming into our system a day. That's quite a lot of scale. And we have 85,000 applications which have our SDK implemented. About our culture, we believe in simplicity. We're closure first. We're actually one of the biggest closure shops in EMEA. And we believe that all code is eventually throwaway code. We're not afraid to experiment, rewrite, start over, uh, to just fit our code to our ever-changing needs. Now that you have learned a little bit about AppsFlyer, my company, and how we're a 24-7 SaaS company, you can probably guess why we needed a seamless, um, seamless zero-downtime migration. We are serving end users 24-7. Uh, now let's go back to the reason why we're all here, why, uh, how we completed um, a zero-downtime migration. We did that by following a few simple steps. We identified the problem of our old service. We defined our goals from our new service. We chose the right technology for us. We then uh, implemented correct design and had a full company migration. So a little bit of context. API Gateway is the service we eventually migrated to Go. What is API Gateway? An API Gateway is a reverse proxy serving microservices as APIs. Um, it acts as a gatekeeper, as the name implies, and it basically connects clients to microservices. Typical features of an API Gateway might be authentication of a user, authorization of a request, uh, security rules, and also throttling requests if necessary. API Gateway reduces code complexity by having one single central and manageable way to enforce access and to impose limits. Now, let's dive into our implementation of our old API Gateway, and feel free to try and guess what issues we had and why we just needed a new solution. And onto our old API Gateway design. API Gateway um, did uh, authentication, authorization, and reverse proxy into our management system. It served as a single uh, point of entry into our system. It served over 80 API services, and it was written in Clojure, the language all AppsFlyer engineers felt the most comfortable with at the time. 
Okay, this is not going. <laughs> Just a second. Okay. Um, our API gateway was also called the bouncer. So you might hear me referring it, it to it as the bouncer all over the talk. So just know what I'm talking about. It would have requests coming in uh, from the web. It would then authenticate each request using information obtained from an account repository. It would then authorize each request. And we had a little interesting authorization mechanism. Each microservice would register uh, the URLs it wanted the bouncer to authorize. It would register those URLs to an outside DB, which you can see here is the console. And then the bouncer would take these URLs uh, and would know it would have to authorize when obtaining those URLs. Before proxying the request on, the bouncer would add user and account data to the header of the request for the originating, uh, for the final microservice to have, um, I want to say, initial data on the originating end user. It would then proxy the request uh, to the right microservice. Over time, uh, we started working with uh, more and more customers, and the request rate into our system grew. Um, we developed more and more features, and we uh, had we created more microservices uh, to be under the API gateway, and the API uh, endpoint count grew as well. All this growth couldn't have been done without a decent employee growth. Um, so communication, which used to be done as a word of mouth or maybe a message app in Slack, was just not efficient anymore. We had to find different communication rules that would be easy to apply and everyone would know of uh, and everyone could easily use. One thing that I've, I've learned over the years uh, of my experience is that as your company grows big, your problems grow big as well. As your company scales, your problems will scale as well and our problems just scaled so much. Really, um, Really slowly, our bouncer just started falling apart. And believe me, we tried to do everything of what we could within our own team. We enlarged the machines up on AWS, we scaled up on machines, and we just added patch upon patch just to have a, li a little bit of breathing space. But each patch took a long time and was very complex to make, and the breathing space that it gave us diminished very fast. We knew we had to do something big, we just didn't know what yet. Going back to our agenda, uh, the first step in a successful migration is to identify your problems. And the major problems that we had with our services were basically due to design decisions we made in early stages, which just didn't take into account the big scale we would grow to be. Our first problem was unsatisfying scalability. Uh, the service and the proxy and the specific implementation we have used in Clojure were synchronous and allowed up to only 60 concurrent requests. Requests coming into our system uh, often download complex reports and sometimes take up to a few minutes to return. So 60 was not enough at all. In order to solve this, we, had a l we scaled up on a lot of redundant bouncer instances just to be, av to be available if needed. And sometimes we had brief uh, times of unavailabilities. And let me clarify here. Uh, since the API gateway, is the entry point and the exit point to the system. If it is unavailable, your whole system would be unavailable as well. Availability for the service is crucial. A second problem we had is that the header size increased over time. And let me just have a small recap. Um, the bouncer, before sending the request, proxying it to, rel to the relevant microservice, it would add initial user and account data to the header of the request in order for the receiving microservice to have initial data on the end user. As you know, uh, HTTP header size is limited. And over time, we added more and more information to the account and to the header. And we started working with accounts which just had a very big initial account data. Soon enough, our, um, there were uh, big accounts with big headers, which would just be dropped by the network. Uh, this forced us to make very uh, urgent fixes per account and very urgent ones uh, as well because these were customers which were not getting, in, getting any service. Our last problem was that authorization was very easy to break. Every microservice 
would write their own authorization URLs in an outside database. A small mistake by the registering service could break authorization for its own service for other service or for all services served by the API gateway. It was really dangerous. <laughs> uh, now that we knew our problems, we had to think of our main goals. We had many fixes we wanted over time and many goals that we just talked about uh, when, when first experiencing the, pr the issues. But here we focused on just a short list that we would need out of our new service. First, we wanted a scalable service, one could which would withstand our growing scale. We wanted a simple service, both in terms of code and in terms of design. We needed here proper rules all engineers could apply and easily work with. Our third goal is to have an observable service. Uh, API Gateway is the entry point and the exit point of the system. It is just the perfect place to have a broad look over all of your services and over all of your system. Now to invest our, our possibilities. From our point of view, we had three options. Our first one is to just make more patches in code. But the bouncer code was so complex, it was really such spaghetti code. Each fix took a long time. It risked us with unexpected bugs. And the value that each fix gave us diminished very fast. Our second option was to use an off-the-shelf or an open source solution. There are many solutions out there, and we look deeply into two solutions. The first one, which is the icon on the right, is API gate, uh, it's Golang's uh, traffic. It's uh, a reverse proxy and a load balancer. And the second one was Kong, which is an API gateway uh, written in Lua and running over Nginx. Both were very good, but none of them just fit our needs exactly, and we knew that we would have to write a decent amount of code on top of them just to obtain what we wanted. Our third option was to rewrite the service from scratch just to fit our needs. And you guessed it, we chose that option. But we didn't know what technology to choose yet. Our gut said closure, since it was just our comfort zone, both infrastructure-wise and both in the knowledge we had. But we also just thought there might be a language more fitting for the service, and we wanted to try something different. Um, step three in a successful migration is to choose the correct technology. There is no right choice. Uh, there are pros and cons to each, but we looked at a few aspects to reach the best technology for us. We researched for a technology which would answer our, our initial goals and also could withstand our growing, um, our growing traffic. We minded the documentation each language had and the support it had, both in having a supporting tech community and in having, um, just a second, ju both in having a, supported, a supporting tech community and both in being able, uh, in our infrastructure group, being able to support our, um, the language we would choose. We minded the learning curve in going to a language different than Clojure, but also wanted to take this as an opportunity. We were an ultimate Clojure shop at the time and wanted to take this as an opportunity to introduce a new language to our system. Therefore, we wanted a language which could grow with our business and be fit for a number of services at AppsFire. We wanted to take this chance and have a stronger engineering teams so that we could have different technology options for different problems. As you probably know, Go has so many advantages for this type of service, and it's not surprising we chose it. Go is scalable and concurrent by nature, thanks to its Go routine and channel support. Its standard library includes a reverse proxy out of the box, which is just the main aspect of an API gateway. It has a fast learning curve, and we could allow the time to learn it. And also, it's the first Go service we will have at Apps Flyer. It will be an experiment to see how well we grow um, a second language at our company. Our fourth step in a successful migration is having correct design. We, have requ we would have requests coming in from the web, and then each request would go through a complete and ordered pipeline of authentication, authorization, service discovery, and then being proxied on to the relevant microservice. We solved the increasing header size by passing only the user ID instead of all of the account data, which we did before. 
each microservice would calculate a response, would send it back to the API gateway, and the API gateway would send it back to the end user. Now let's, let's look at the architecture. The API gateway would have requests coming in from the web. It would first authenticate them using the same account reposit repository from before. It would then, oops, not this. Uh, it would then authorize the requests using conventions and not using a blocked set of URLs like before. I would go into the conventions in detail later on. Um, it would then proxy the request to the relevant microservice, passing only the user ID and not all of the account data. And then each microservice would use that user ID obtained uh, from the API gateway and went to the same account repository use a using a client we predefined in order to get the same information the bouncer used to add to the request. So the, microservers, the microservices would have to have minimum changes while work wi working with the new service. Now, let's look at about how we answered our initial goals while just using Go and a more correct design. Our first goal, if you remember correctly, uh, is to have a scalable service. Go is scalable uh, by nature. And the feature that helped us the most in having a scalable, scalable service is using Go's uh, reverse proxy, which is in its standard library. The feature that helped us with scalability the most is the ability to stream the data through the proxy and not to store it in memory like we did before. And it's a feature out of the box of Go. Uh, using Go's reverse proxy allowed us to handle 100 times more of concurrent instant concurrent requests per instance. It was really 60 over uh, 6,000. It was an amazing advantage for us. So let's dive into the reverse proxy uh, and how simple it is. All you need to do is to import package HTTP util. In order to create the reverse proxy, you have just one function, which is the new single host reverse proxy, and you get the proxy. You, gave it, uh, you give that function the URL you want to actually proxy to. And then in order to serve the request, you just have to call the serve HTT HTTP function on that proxy. It's really that simple. It's these two lines of code, which were in our API gateway, which helped our scalabil scalability the most. And we have these lines of code in our service as well. Our second goal uh, for the service uh, is to have a simple service. Uh, we obtain simplicity. One of the ways we obtain simplicity is by having conventions. We use this for conventions for authorization. We wanted to have a few query params, which were conventional that each request, each microservice, which designed a request would know um, the request would be authorized by default. Now, let's view an example. A specific microservice designed a URL uh, with the app ID query param. The app ID query param is conventional and would be authorized by default. So a request coming into the API gateway would first be authenticated. It would then be authorized, and the authorization engine basically checks if the URL has one of the conventional query param. In this case, it does. It takes this value, puts it through uh, the authorization engine, which basically checks if the authenticated user has a permission to view this app. In case it has permission, the, re the request would be authorized and would be proxied to the relevant microservice by default. In case the user does not have permission to view the app, the request would be responded with a 404, and this request would not be proxied on to any microservice, meaning that each microservice which designs a URL with the conventional query param would know its requests are being uh, authorized by default. Our second way of obtaining uh, simplicity, in my opinion, is just by using Go's uh, statically typed nature. Up until now, we used a dynamically typed language and a dyna dynamically typed language, and this helped us just, ju in my opinion, it helped us so much. In a statically typed language like Go, uh, variable types are explicitly declared and enforced upon compilation. On the contrary, in a dynamically typed language like Clojure, Types really don't matter, and you would find out about a type exception in runtime if you're lucky. In my opinion, <laughs> um, woo, 
I got excited. In my opinion, uh, moving to develop in a statically typed language helped us tremendously while creating this new service. It forced us to deal with hard questions and to make contracts with ourselves and with the services using us right when we were writing our first lines of code. Uh, we had to answer questions like, how is each request going to look like? What variables is it, it going to have? And what the types are going to be? In addition, the type served as great initial documentation for us, and a lot of errors were found right when we were developing, closer to the location they were introduced, and therefore making uh, solving them just much simple. Our last and final goal was to have an observable service. Um, API Gateway is the ultimate place to look over your whole system, since it is the gateway which keeps all services under it. Uh, apart from regular metrics we had for our own services, for our own service, we wanted to have uh, the rate and the latency of each request coming to each service uh, in our own dash dashboard. We could see how each service is doing, what scale is it, is it getting, what the customer trends are, and how services are compared to another. Overall, we could also look at our initial SLAs to our customers. It was a true benefit out of the box. Now, we developed a new uh, service. It's more scalable, it's observable, um, it's really amazing. I have nothing to tell you about it. <laughs> but no one's using it just yet. Apart from the code challenges we had already faced while developing this uh, new service, we knew we're ready now for a full company migration. As Jeffrey Geert once says, everyone likes progress, but just no one likes change. We knew that apart from the code challenges, we're now facing a whole new kind of challenge. How do we convince all teams to actually take the time and do the migration? How do we convince them the change is in fact better? And how do we convince them the change is not going to cause a degradation to their own service? And more importantly than that, how do we do a migration? How do you not drag this migration for years going forward? How do we have an actual deadline? The full company migration demanded change over 80 API services, all API services which were under the bouncer. It demanded change over 15 teams, three offices, and two countries. We wanted to have a controlled and gradual rollout in order to um, migrate services as we go and then be able to detect issues and solve them uh, slowly. We used an ALB to route the traffic between the old and new flow. Because we wanted a controlled rollout, we wanted both flows running at the same time, and we needed some sort of routing mechanism. So uh, the new flow with the API gateway was running with migrated services, and we would just route, write the URLs um, of the migrated services in um, a, the Amazon's ALB, which is an application load balancer. And then the ALB would know to route uh, that traffic to the new flow unmigrated services, which were still sitting under the bouncer, we would not put the route down in the ALB uh, routing mechanism, and they would be uh, routed to the bouncer uh, by default. Uh, we had two authentication flows. The bouncer was using uh, session cookies, and the API gateway was using a JWT token. In order for one authentication of a user, one login of a user, to be able to seamlessly travel between the two flows, uh, we created the old authentication method in the API gateway in the new flow, and the new authentication method um, in the bouncer in the old flow. So that user would have one authentication and would be able to seamlessly, seamlessly travel and make requests to the old flow or to the new flow without even noticing uh, they are being served by two different services. So this really um, is an overview of what I just talked about. Uh, we had both flows running all throughout the migration. We used an ALB, uh, application load balancer, to route the traffic between the new or the old flow. And we put the routes down of uh, the migrated services to be routed directly to the API gateway. And all other routes would be direct directed to the bouncer, to the old flow. Um, the transition between the flows was seamless because we created both authentication flows uh, in both uh, the API gateways. And as I said before, 
uh, the code here, the challenge here was not code anymore. It was fully psychological. It was hard to convince different engineering teams to touch something they just did not know anything about and was currently functioning. Did you ever hear, if it ain't broke, then don't fix it? Well, that was the overall feeling when we first initiated the migration. We had to find uh, a decent plan and a few convincers as well in order to convince all in engineering teams to make the change. We prepared a simple migration plan which had a few steps in it. It was truly um, a migration for dummies, a plan for dummies. It had only seven steps in it, which explained in detail how uh, to stop using the bouncer and how to move on to the API gateway. It uh, told about the conventions and the new authorization rules so that even if teams were not using it now, they would know how to use it in the future. We made sure all teams knew about the migration benefits, how thanks to Go, uh, the service is more available, more scalable, how easy and more straightforward it is to work with the new service so that people would know they're putting an effort now, but it will be worth their time in the long run. We knew that practice makes perfect. And in order for the teams to have confidence in the change, uh, we gave support for this intermediate change with both the new and the old flow locally and in staging environments. We just used, instead of the ALB, we used an en Nginx to route the traffic. It was really uh, similar to production. So that each team could actually test the change, test the migration, and uh, even test the rollback if needed, just to have more confidence in order to get this to production faster. Uh, we also created a client for backward compatibility. And let me go back. Um, the bouncer would add uh, user and account data to the header of the request. And we created a client. Uh, the API gateway would only add the user ID. And we created a client in order for the services to obtain the same uh, data the bouncer used to add to the request so that the teams would not have to make a lot of changes and could just use the client in order to get the same information ha as they had before. One of the best things we have done uh, is really uh, the time, the thought, and the code we have invested in only the migration process. We were not afraid to write code. We knew what we'd thrown away in like a few months after the migration would be over. We looked at it as a bridge from an old and outdated technology to a new and better technology. And we knew that the stronger the bridge would be and uh, the bigger the, the bridge would be, people would want to walk on it and pass to the other side. If we, wouldn't, uh, if we wouldn't give a strong bridge, the migration would just not happen on time. And of course, how can we do without persistence? Uh, we monitored carefully and offered to give a hand when needed. We made a reasonable deadline, and we had checkpoints along the way to see that we are actually um, uh, on our deadline. And finally, after a few months, it finally happened. We finally worked only with the API gateway, and we shut down the bouncer and the ALB. The best thing is, which is kind of funny to think about, no end user noticed a change. Only we received a much more confidence over our system um, and quieter nights as well. Now, a year after the migration is over, um, we can finally look at the benefits. Thanks to Go and thanks to the reverse proxy, uh, we have a much more stable system. We are using only a few instances of API Gateway instead of tens of bouncer instances which we have used before and we have a much more available system as well. It's very easy to add features thanks to the ordered pipeline design we have implemented and conventions allowed flexibility by adding more authorization engines and more authorization rules in just a matter of a single deploy. And finally, uh, the, go the experiment with inserting a language different than Clojure has succeeded. We now counting, um, I counted really on Thursday, we have 39 services uh, written in Go uh, in our company. And this is just a year after uh, our single experiment has succeeded. And we have more coming. So it is truly a second language at our company. 
<laughs> um, to summarize, we met all of our goals while carefully uh, following a few steps. We identified the problems from our old service, which was unsatisfying scalability, header size, which increased over time, and authorization, which was easy to break. We defined our goals from our new ser service, which was simplicity, scalability, and observability. We chose the right technology, and Go has been such a good choice. Its minimal learning curve had made this not only fast, easy, and very fun to learn, and its support of a standard, its uh, library support of a reverse proxy made this a real measurable change and a more robust one as well. We designed the service correctly with an easily uh, ordered pipeline, and we had a full company migration, which actually minded the people uh, behind the screens and not only the code, which made this just so successful. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs> Any questions? So as I understand it, uh, a good portion of your engineers was redirected to the new work, um, the work of the transition. So how did you manage the, the fact that you had an old system that was already falling apart, so you had to keep that alive, and also uh, develop and learn also the technology for the new, for the new service? So um, it's a good question. Um, we split our team into two. Uh, one which was just, you know, trying to make this work. We scaled up on a, a lot of machines uh, up on AWS, and every urgent fix we needed to make, we made it uh, in order just to keep on working. But also, we had a deadline uh, to move to the new uh, to the new service. So. Half of the team uh, were developing the new service and took care of the migration uh, and working with all the teams. And the other half was just dealing with, you know, keeping the head above, above the water and not falling apart. It was a tough one, but that's why we needed, like, a true deadline for this. And how long did it take for the, the whole process to, to be completed? How long? Yeah. Uh, the development, I want to say, just the initial development took... Um, a few months, maybe three months, and then the migration took another four. So overall, it was more than uh, half a year. It was a long process, but persistency helped us well just to, you know, have a deadline and finish it. It was a really nice uh, project as well. <laughs> Thank you. Um, as you're hosting on AWS, um, do you have any comparison in the price? You had to pay for the old bouncer as you vertically scaled and the new uh, Go service? So I, I don't know the price exactly, um, but we're using the same instance, uh, the same type of instance. And when we had a bouncer, we had a few tens, I want to say maybe 30, maybe more, more, maybe less. And now we have a few, just like five or less. Um, so that's around the ratio of the price we're using. Because so around about six, the factor. Yeah, uh, more or less, yes. Uh, going back to, to splitting the teams, uh, how, uh, how did you decide uh, who's going to work on the legacy system and who's going to work on the, the new cool thing? Uh, and like, uh, how, what was the sentiment of the, the team uh, members that were stuck with uh, maintaining the old code while everyone <laughs> else was having fun with uh, this new thing? <laughs> um, it's a good question. <laughs> um, so we believe... Uh, uh, we believe it's a mistake uh, to give uh, new engineers or like um, uh, newcomers uh, to the company to just give them a legacy s system and tell them, okay, just handle this because you're new. Uh, we basically have had a split. Um, we the new team which dealt with the new service and the new API gateway uh, was composed of new and old engineers, and the old uh, the old team which dealt with the bouncer was composed of new and old engineers as well. So, you know, we chose, um, for the new team, we chose uh, a lead, 
which like to experiment with uh, new technologies. And so that we could throw him to a technology and he, um, they would be able to, uh, they would love it and love to do new things. And we just, I don't know, randomly chose new engineers as well. And for the old teams, we just chose um, someone which is um, a lot of, a lot like knows the importance of it. Um, they are uh, an expert and they are engineers for a while now. And that way uh, the new engineers felt okay because they had uh, experts uh, in their team. And also um, the more experienced engineers, they knew they're doing this for a better cause. Um, I wanna say uh, the less experienced engineers, the split was random, but between the more experienced one, it was just the person who liked to experience, experience more was in the API Gateway team. But it was really, you know, we looked at it as a big, pro a big project that would just help our, help our custom, uh, help our company the most, and we were both uh, psyched about uh, this new project, even if like you know handling the black work. <laughs> yeah, thank you. There are more questions there. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, I'm curious if you could talk more about the things you did to help other teams participate in the migration. Uh, um, like you mentioned that sometimes you needed to offer more support to some teams. When did you decide to offer that support and what were the kinds of things you did? Um, in the beginning when we initiated the migration we had like a big meeting uh, where we told everyone the benefits and we passed around uh, the migration plan and we just told them okay now you all start working. And there were teams which were very busy uh, with production work and there were teams which you know just didn't pick it up, just didn't look at it because it was something new, they just didn't want to touch it. And the, we had people from our team just, uh, we asked for designated um, uh, people from each team and we just had really daily meetings when we just opened the computer together, opened the plan, went over it and just, uh, I want to say pair programmed and uh, just explained in detail, gave them more confidence, helped them to set up their local environment. Even everything, even when everything was written, uh, they sometimes just needed a hand and needed pair programming. And you know, more teams needed it, needed more meetings, and uh, other teams were just more independent. But uh, we would really have daily meetings with all teams just in order to have this done. It wasn't simple. <laughs> One more question. Uh, yes. In the beginning, you, you saw that uh, when you decided uh, that the most feasible option was to rewrite your service in, uh, in a different line or to, to do a complete rewrite. Uh, obviously, you uh, explored Clojure as an option. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I guess you explored Go. Uh, what are the languages or frameworks that you explore before you uh, set out to Go? Um, we we didn't explore that much. Uh, we thought about rewriting it in Clojure, like you said, but we just wanted to take this as an experiment to put something uh, new. We also looked just as uh, on Nginx, just to have a routing mechanism and to write a whole, a lot of code on top of it, uh, which Nginx was very good in performance. But we had an uh, architecture come to our system, come to our company at that time, and he was really pro-Go, and he said, okay, listen, uh, Go would just be so perfect to it. We have so many uh, examples on the web. We even have Go's traffic, which is working so well. Um, this is perfect for us going forward as a company. We had a few benchmarks, but uh, just decided to just go for it uh, because it would be fit for a number of our other services as well. Okay, the time is up, so thank you very much, Hadas, thank for you. your talk. I have uh, stickers as well. Oh, go for stickers if you want to take some. <laughs> okay.